Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusker, here for a special edition of the show. So, um, I'm kind of lazy today. I didn't set up the green screen. Uh, I'm doing the Thanksgiving episode. I'm um, doing a couple weeks early, um, mainly because, well, I don't really have a lot of time between now and the, the I guess, next week, because today's the 12th of November, um, late night, 12th, well, like 11 o'clock, 12th November. Uh, and the following week, I'm not going to have any time. So, I figured I'd get this ho Halloween. Thanksgiving episode done, and then um, you're going to see me in the same shirt for two more episodes talking about some uh, Oregon stuff. So um, I've got some wines here. Now, you, you know I normally do three wines for a, Halloween, for, for a holiday special, but since I decided to do this Riesling here, I saw this Riesling from a few months ago, so we're going to revisit that. All right, so first of all, let's, let's just get into... The very first wine here. So uh, this is the non-vintage André Clouet uh, Un Jour de 1911. Uh, we get the little close-up there of that. Um, so actually, I got this from uh, Psalm Select, and um, dang it, I had the I had the price up here real quick. Let me look. Let me pull it up again. There we go. Uh, the retail on it is eighty-five dollars. I didn't bring the, uh, I didn't bring the, uh, what should we call it? You know what I mean, the wine key, to, to properly remove the foil. Uh, so after tax and shipping, uh, it's more like shipping, um, it's more like shipping uh, insurance, because when you buy from Psalm Select, you buy like you build a case or whatever you want to call it. Um, shipping's technically free, but then you have like this insurance to do. So after everything was all said, then ninety one sixteen, uh, and I bought this. Uh, I bought this November uh, November twelfth, two thousand eighteen. So I've actually had this wine for over a year. Actually, hi. What do you know? I bought it a year ago today, uh, the day I recorded it. Um, so let's kind of go over who this dude is. Uh, I'm just going to read from Cobble's um, uh, write-up. Uh, this, this is not the first time he's offered this wine. I didn't buy it the year before that they offered it. Um, so it says, without argument, Jean-Francois Clouet is a Pinot Noir specialist. His home base is in Grand Cru Bouzy. Uh, his, home, his home base in Grand Cru Bouzy is widely regarded as one of Champagne's greatest sites for the noble grape and his talent shines uh, brightest in Cuvée 1911, a sumptuous champagne that demands recognition. Uh, that's why we coined the phrase 1911 time, I guess, at their place. Um, so, uh, said that, I um, said this time around the bubbly handwritten script in the accompanying booklet marks the disgorgement date as 31 7 2018, so July 31st, 2018. In the latest edition, uh, yeah, it says doesn't disappoint. So let's see. The Cloué family first found the spotlight after becoming the official printers for the royal court at Versailles. Does it have the disgorgement date on there? No, I don't see that. This says 918 10. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means anything. Anyway, um, but I know this is the wine I bought. Uh, anyway, um, so they were a printer for the Royal Court at Versailles in the mid 18th century. Um, the estate in Bouzy, which the current owner, Jean Francois Clouet, still calls home, dates back to even further. Uh, beneath the historic site lies their labyrinthine chalk cellar, um, which I think they're called Crayers. 
uh, which still contained partial false walls that hit precious bottles during the Nazi invasion in World War II. Um, let's see. They say that uh, 1911 it has some type of significance to the wine uh, I'm on their website and uh, you know I'm not going to go through the whole website to figure out what it is what was so significant about 1911 but um, as far as what's going on here it's sourced from 10 of their best parcels in Boozy that produce a wine of rich concentration and yeah okay this is the most current release hitting the uh, 50% consisting of barrel fermented selection from 2008 and the other half coming from a blend of 2010 and 12. Um, the blend is a Solera of sorts, so you can also assume quite older vintages are making their way into the mix. Uh, after the wine is, was bottled, it's aged on lees for nearly six years uh, before disgorgement. Um, so, let's check it out. So it's cellar temperature. I didn't have it like in the fridge the whole time. I pulled out of the cellar probably a good 20 minutes ago. So that's why you kind of heard that little extra because it wasn't ice cold. But that should be good because it should be really opened up now. Um, I'm kind of saving this wine really just because uh, I think it was expensive. And um, I was figuring I'd bring it to like tasting group at some point. But um, I need a sparkling wine for this episode. So I was like... I've had this wine for a while, so let's open it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't say. Let's see. Hold on. Let me see if it says anything about 1911 real quick. Uh, nope. Not on, the, on that first page. However, there's a deed they did, dated 1689 requesting... Uh, is a request for a deed for, for purchase of land in Champaign. Um, so it looks like they tried to buy, looks like they bought some uh, champagne or land in Champaign in the late 1600s. Uh, also, as far as 1911, apparently they only produce 1,911 bottles when they make this when they make this wine. So let's check it out. So I mean, like really kind of golden color there. Uh, I'm going to say that's probably more from the age since the disgorgement. Um, it's just they, sorry, they bottled it six years ago. Um, so, or yeah, it was aged. Let's say it with this. It was, it was bottled. Yeah, so it was bottled six years ago. So um, you can get some oxidation even though you got all that pressure in the bottle. You can still get some oxidation. So I would say that that, that really deeper golden color is coming from that since this is a Blanc de Noir, um, yeah. It's barrel fermented, so is everything on barrel? No, no stainless, none of that stuff. It's really kind of rich. Um, there's like this creme brulee, vanilla. Um, like a sweet uh, peach aroma to it. Like a, a slot of vanilla, like this, like a like a dreamsicle. Ooh. Yeah, like a little bit of orange, peach, vanilla. And then you got you got a little bit of that pastry, that little bit of you know um, uh, brioche thing going on here. Wow. Man, this thing is pretty freaking... Del it smells delicious. I cannot wait to try this thing. So in the first sip, it's really more bread-driven than anything else. Like pastry, bread, fresh-baked bread-driven than really anything else. It's almost a disappointment that it didn't have all the fruit that I was expecting. Um, smells delicious though. Like it really smells like a, like an orange or fruit pastry. Let's give it another taste here.
so after like aerating it, the fruit's coming through. So it's really more of a a richer pastry, fruit pastry. It's it smells fruitier than it tastes, but when you aerate it, when you suck that air in, it really has like this this um um I, I can't remember the name of the the actual like pastry, but it's like a fruit, whatever. You've seen it. A little bit of icing on it, a little bit of vanilla. Like you, it's like you're eating that. It's delicious. Again, I was I was kind of expecting maybe more of that flavor on on the palate through the nose, but it smells awesome. It tastes really good. City's super high. Um, the flavor's still lasting. It's not. It's not super, um, I wouldn't call it super intense still, but it's still there. I can still taste a little bit of that fruit, that pastry, the vanilla, the icing, the, the, the um, uh, I can't, I, I, I'm a loss for words because it's really good, but it is expensive. I mean, it's, it's pretty pricey, but you, I mean, you're getting what you're paying for. I, I really believe. God, I mean, I, I think the nose is just phenomenal. So the only thing that sucks about this, I opened it up on a tu on a Tuesday. Anyway, I opened up on a Tuesday. I do have family coming into town on Saturday. It should be good until then. Um, the problem is I'm the only one that's really going to drink anything. So I kind of feel bad because I kind of opened it, and there was no nobody really to share it with. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to have to crush it. I mean, I know, I know you think, I mean, I pretty much drink all the wines anyway, but I'll, but sometimes when I open wines, I like to like share them, like bring them to like friends' houses or have friends come over or bring them to tasting group type of thing. So, uh, the problem if I bring a wine to tasting group, it means that I'm going to drink and, uh, tasting group, uh, unless I'm off from my day job after tasting group, I, I, I have to spit everything. So. But this is really delicious wine. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish that. All right. So moving on to um, wine number two. So it's gonna do a little comparison here. So uh, my friends over at uh, what you call it, Credit Palette uh, earlier this year sent me this wine, which is the 2018 Nick Weiss um, Riesling from Old Vines, uh, the St. Urban's Hof. And uh, I think it's the St. Urban's Hof down here too. That's just where the winery's at. Uh, so, this is in the, so the winery's in the Tsar, or the Saar, uh, which is a tributary or an area of the Mosul. So they sent me this wine uh, earlier this year, and I, re and I put out the review on August 5th, 2019. Let's see, when I actually re recorded the show, you can assume it was sometime in July. So, let's go ahead and taste this wine real quick. I remember liking the wine a lot. So, that means this wine's been under Coravin for at least four months. Or for around four months. Which I'm pretty amazed, I'm pretty surprised I, I've kept this wine. I haven't drank any of it. Um, during that time, I think what it was is I, 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 not that I forgot that I reviewed it, but I kind of thought it was a review wine because I got this one. I don't know. And, uh, I thought I, I had to save it for some reason, but, um, when I, I watched the review and I'll put a link down for the, for that review and it's the first one. So you have to, you don't have to watch the whole review. I basically like the wine. So let's just kind of check it out. And uh, this wine, I this wine normally sells for eighteen dollars. So, 
a somewhat fruit, fruity style, but it's not sweet. It's mostly dry. Um, it's got, I, I describe it as a fruit cup and it's kind of like that. Um, I still get a lot of peach and um, a little cherry to it and a little uh, pineapple and apricot. It's, it has that kind of like, you still have like the, the, like the juice that you get in those fruit cups. It's more the flavor of it rather than the sweetness of it. And there's a crispness and acidity to it, I mean, which it should have. Um, tartness. Uh, I thought there was like another fruit I'm, I'm missing on this. Orange. Basically, it's, whoops. Basically, it's everything except for like lemon, lime, and apple. Just about every other fruit in there. Not quite. I'm not really a strawberry, but. So it was just a good revisit. Um, let's kind of check that out real quick. So then um, recently, like a couple weeks ago, I got this one. So this, and yeah, I'm going to, I should make mention of that, I guess. So this is the 2018 Nick Weiss. Um, Brock, uh, Bach, not Brock, Bachstein Cabinet. Um, this is a uh, Grosselaga or Grosselgevac um, or a GG. Now, a lot of times these wineries will put GG on there. Um, so it basically is the equivalent of Grand Cru. So these guys remember the VDP. Now, this, this particular bottling does not have the VDP uh, logo on it, so it's not adhering to the VDP um, uh, uh, not regulations, like, but I mean, it's, a, it's a private organization. Uh, but you know, it's, it's guidelines, it's regulations, uh, whereas this one is. So because it's listed as a uh, Grosselaga or Grand Cru or GG or Grosses um it has to be a non-dry wine. So it needs to list what they call a Prodicot level, which was Cabinet. So Cabinet is the first level of ripeness. Now, we like to call that sweetness level and it is to a certain extent but in reality it's a ripeness level so the grapes this is the earliest pick of the grapes they, ha they can't be above a certain uh level which i don't remember what the level is it's called eschel so we use bricks in the united states and we use bricks in a lot of other parts of the world uh in germany they use eschel i believe they also do the, do the same thing in austria and there's a conversion for it um, you know, certain national equates to a certain amount of bricks. And then there's other, there's some other, um, uh, measurements you can use. There we go. I thought I heard that. Remember when I had the problem with the Corvin for a while? I they heard that. Well, sh I thought I heard it, but I didn't. That was good because I shouldn't be. This is like still kind of brand new. Anyway, um, so you have Cabinet, uh, Spätlese, Ausschlese, Baron Ausschlese, uh, and then Baron, Baron Ausschlese and Eiswein are the exact same ripeness levels, and then you have Trocken Baron Ausschlese, which is the highest ripeness level. Now, they really do translate into sweetness levels, effectively, but Cabinet and Spätlese, and I think even Ausschlese can actually be dry or technically dry, um, or they have the appearance of dryness because there's so much acidity in Riesling that you can get away with having higher levels of sugar, but still have appearance of dryness. Once you're at the Ausschlesser level, it's going to be some type of sweetness. Now, what I tell people if, 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 if uh, they're using, so if they're using, if the winery is using the Prodicat levels, um, you're assuming there's a fruitiness or a sweetness to it. It doesn't mean there is, because Cabinet can also be this really refreshing, dry style. And it kind of depends on the producer. So certain producers, it's going to be dry. Certain producers, it's not. Um, but yeah, so uh, just kind of go back on to the Nick Weiss thing. So if, if you watched my last episode, 
Um, you'll see these member of he's a member of fair and green. I'm not going to go through the whole fair and green thing is, but it's basically a sustainability thing. Um, I also try to go to the, the website. The website doesn't work. Um, as far as the Nick Vice, you know, N I K W E I S dot com, it's not working. So on why it's not working for me today, maybe it'll work for you when you watch the episode. Maybe it works tomorrow. I don't know. But usually when websites don't work and it's not like, uh, it was like one of those things like the website doesn't exist or isn't updated or whatever. It means it's down, but or like gone, but hopefully it's not. But, um, uh, anyway, anywho, uh, let's kind of talk about this particular wine before we get into it. Um, it's, it, it retails for 26 to $27 in the email I got. One part of the email says 27 bucks. The other one's the other part says $26. So figure 26 to $27 retail. So the Ockfin, uh, Ockfin is an ancient wine town located in one of the Tsar River's tributaries. Um, so the Tsar is a tributary of the Mosul, and this is um, basically another tributary of the Tsar. Um, so old school, it was the Mosul Tsar Ruer. Was it Ruer or Ruver? It was R-U-W-E-R. And Tsar is spelled S-A-A-R, so Tsar. Um, anyway, so one of the tributaries, it became famous throughout its outstanding vineyard site of Aachen. Ockfener, which is Ockfen, so it says Ockfen is the town. You add er, that means of. So, of Ockfer, uh, Bockstein. So the Bockstein Vineyard of Ockfer, Ockfenferner, Bockstein, uh, which is a steep south-facing slope. The soil soil consists of hard, gravelly slate rock, which has a very fine, powdery surface, easily absorbed by the vine's roots. This results uh, in wines of great mineral impact. I'm trying to like avoid anything that tells me what the wine is supposed to taste like, but it's m almost all reasons are mineral anyway. Uh, the top of the hill is densely covered with forests, which collect the rain and retain the moisture so that it drains consistently through the vineyard soil, preventing water stress of the vines even in the driest of seasons. Uh, it's 100% Riesling, if I hadn't already covered that. Um, so... Trestling is listed here, single posts, which is traditional method. So um, I'm doing my studying and actually did some studying on German wine today. Uh, while I was at jury duty, did not get picked. Like most people, I'm happy I wasn't. Really just because while I would be happy to serve, if I did get picked, not getting picked just means I don't have to like adjust like my personal life. Like I wouldn't have been able to, I, well, maybe I would have been able to record this tonight, but you never know. Anyway, so single posts gives you a lot more flexibility in the in the vineyard as far as how things are positioned and movement between the vines. And what happens is, and maybe I'll remember to show this picture from my visit to Germany when I went into one of the vineyards with uh, 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 Daniel, which is uh, Ernie Lawson's nephew. But they'll have what they call it, it'll call the Mosul Heart. So it's a single post, but they the way they position the the um, the shoots, I guess, it forms into a heart and it allows them to have easy access to the grapes. Uh, fermented by indigenous yeast in both large oak casks and stainless steel tanks. Uh, Nine percent um, alcohol, so that it should have some sweetness to it. If it was fully dry, which it's not supposed to be, if it's a GG. Um, using the Prodicot, um, then it shouldn't be fully dry. Let's see. Uh, he founded it in uh, so this winery was founded in 1947. Um, let's see. Since 2000, they've been a member of the VDP. Um, let's see here. It just says, uh, uh, their passion is to express the unique terroir in the wine's taste. Therefore, grapes grow in six, at least six different steep sites in both the Mosul and Zar Valley. Uh, a traditional, mostly manual cultivation and a natural, minimalistic cellar working practice lead to elegant, well-structured, yada, yada, yada. Okay. All right. So let's just get into the wine. So, I mean, this this really nice wine. Absolutely. 
and it's not that it doesn't smell like Riesling, it does, it's, it's really fruity. This has that more waxy-ish, petrol-ish aroma that you're like, oh, you're totally in Riesling land with this. The fruit isn't as uh, pronounced. It's there, but it's, it's more like in balance with everything else. Yeah, it's really like that plastic, petrol, and plastic in a good way. Like wax, like those wax animals you get at the zoo. I mean, I don't know about your zoo, but my zoo growing up, you get those, you get the little like vending machine and maybe like a little plastic animal and there was like a hot wax and you can still smell the wax. That's what this smells like. That's what Riesling smells like a lot of times. And I'd say it's more of the, more of that um, tree fruit, the peaches, things like that. Let's taste it. <coughs> so off the bat, yes, there's a bit of sweetness to it. Is it cloyingly sweet? Is it like dessert wine sweet? No. The acid is ripping high. So it's there to balance it. I, I just said ripping high, right? The extra sugar is there to, to really balance it. So we're probably, uh, I'm just going to guess, 9 to 15 grams per liter of sugar on this. Like, that would be a sweet wine in most place, most place, most cases. But in this case, it's there to balance it out. Um, but it's young. Like, it's really young. Um, I mean, I know it said that, I think, it, did it talk about aging? I can't, no. I'm sorry. I did wake up really early for, for jury duty. I mean, it's super young. I, I think this is a wine that if I, if I had not a Corvin in it at all, and I'd laid it down for like five, six, ten years, like ten years minimum, it would be singing. Um, and that, like I mentioned the, in the last review of the other one, you know, Riesling can age. It can age really well. Like, it doesn't have to be super expensive Riesling. The acidity alone will make most Rieslings age really well. You don't have to drink them immediately. Even like five years or, or maybe a few years less, these wines are just going to be, and they change. The, the character, I mean, all wines that age change in characteristic, but Riesling, man, it just like, it just seems like it gets more alive. So that waxiness comes through, the peach comes through, um, apricot, that kind of stuff. Not quite anything else on the fruit. A touch of pineapple on it. Yeah, actually, actually, I think now, now I think about it, a little more pineapple too. Like that really just tart, fresh pineapple. Like you just like, you just cut it up. Um, yeah, wow. Power suggestion right there, buddy. Um, this really nice wine. It's 26, 27 bucks. It's totally worth it. It's not super sweet. Um, it's really refreshing, light, kind of, yeah, but refreshing. Great for Thanksgiving right there. So I didn't even talk about it. like start off with the clue A, get everybody happy, little bubbles, yada yada yada, everybody talks. And um, then you head into your, like your first course, maybe a lighter course, maybe it's an appetizer. I can see like if you have like some cured meats, the salinity really works well with, with, the, um, with the acidity on this and the touch of sweetness on it. You get like that, you know, um, you know, sweet and sour almost thing going on or savory, savory and tart. Um, so I can see that working really well. Um, you could have a nice refreshing salad. Maybe you throw some strawberries in there, like a spinach salad, blue cheese, uh, candied pineapple, uh, candied, uh, not pineapple, candied pecans or candied walnuts, something like that. Yeah. So it's wild. I'm not doing any other reviews tonight, so. Though I'm gonna do those, my two, um, uh, Oregon recap videos, and I'm probably going to crack open a bottle of wine. All right, so super nice. 
I like this a lot. Thank you, friends at Creative Palette. All right, so the last wine, just because I love Beaujolais so much. Now, I've actually bought this wine a couple times from Psalm Select. So this is the 2014 um, Pascal uh, and Jean-Philippe Granger uh, Le Chazignol Moulin Avant. All right. Um, did I? Let's look. Let's see how much I paid for that. I forgot to pull. I mean, I had it up, but um, anyway. So I had the 13 and the 14. Now um, I had another bottle of the 13 because I bought two bottles of the 13 before I bought this one, and I know I brought the 13 to um, tasting group, or I drank it, but I'm pretty sure I brought it to tasting group. So we are going to look up this one. So the 14, I paid a total of uh, $27.89, and I bought it in 18, July of 18. Um, whereas the other one I bought, <laughs> I bought it March of 18. So I bought both of them in the same year. Um, that's one of those where I was like, I was trying to like get all the, all the crew Beaujolais and I probably forgot I had this Moulin Avant, but, um, and I, I know I didn't review it because I looked for the review in case I had reviewed it. So I either brought it to tasting group cause I was trying to, I was trying to get all the um, all the crew, but I think that I, did, I did that earlier this year. I mean, I was buying them for like a year, or I was just like, "Hey, I'm gonna buy it" because I had two bottles of it. Uh oh. No, there's 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 gas going in there. It just felt like it had like popped. All right. So yeah, twenty seven eighty nine total. That includes like the shipping insurance and then um, I think whatever else. I think this is before they started showing. I can pull. I can pull up the whole order. It looks like they started like charging on a per order basis. I think like two fifty an order. So let me get my details of the order here. Taxes, yeah, taxes and shipping was 10%. I mean, 1%, so 26 cents. So this, that, that didn't even charge me like, um, who's he, what's it, like insurance on that. All right, so Pascal Granger, who is this dude? Go away. So, um, I read some of this, so now I'm trying to find where I want to start because it's, it's there's a bunch of like fluff at the beginning, basically saying how good this wine is and why you should buy it. So uh, the farmstead and vineyards are located in and around the hamlet of Les Poupées in the village of Julianas, which is a farther north crew of Ber of, uh, of uh, Beaujolais. Uh, oh yeah, normally I don't have this chair next to me, do I? Uh, the family has farmed these same vineyards going on three centuries. What? Uh, dating back to the Napoleonic era with, with parcels continually being passed down across multiple generations of Granger fathers and sons. Um, this one comes from a microscopic half hectare parcel of 50 to 70 year old Gamay vines planted on granite. Uh, they hand harvest it before approximately 30% is left. Fruit is hand harvested before approximately 30% is left to ferment in whole clusters while the remainder is destemmed. Um, the fermentation occurs in cement vats and can extend upwards of three weeks. Um, and even for Moulin Avant standards, that's pretty long. And then um, following fermentation, the wine was racked into neutral oak demi moods and fudras so I see large casks fudras are like super large uh, for six months of aging and then an additional period of bottle aging takes place before release um, yes soil is granite and uh, it says drink now through 2023 on their website 
So, um, real quick before I get into the wine, Moulin Avant and Morgan are two of your more powerful um, Beaujolais. I tend to prefer Morgan a little bit more than Moulin Avant, but pretty much any Cru Beaujolais, I'm going to be crushing. All right. And this is what, a 14? Uh, I know you can't really see it, but there is definitely a little bit of browning on the color there. Man, it's going to smell good. It's going to taste good a bit. So that collection of spices and a little bit of like sweetness, like a little bit of not quite soy sauce, but like a sweet plum, kind of pruny, kind of that desiccated fruit. Pepper, sweet spices, clove, almost like a sweet bread. Nice. Hmm. GD. This is good wine. All these wines are really good. Like, this is a stellar lineup. Yeah, I, I get it. This is expensive. But $18, 26 27 about the same price. So under 30 you got some killer wines. Now, granted, normally I'd only be like this, okay? This $18 bottle of wine would not be on camera. It was just more for, for comparison purposes. But if you went with either one of these, you're doing good. I, I, this one is like definitely, in my mind, the higher quality one, the quote better one. But man, this Riesling. So, I mean, honestly, I think this would be really great with like, the, you know, your traditional Thanksgiving ham. So, cause it'll have that clove and that, that the pineapples and that spices and that sweetness to it. Uh, I mean, the reasoning probably go really well with it too. Um, so you have that, but then if you're going like with the turkey and the stuffing, the stuffing, you know, has all, stuffing can be like spicy, like spices, um, and rich, um, and maybe have, you have maybe a little fruity. Um, so you have the stuffing with the turkey, either way, you're, you're, you're killing it. So I'm not doing Beaujolais Nouveau. Because it doesn't come out to the third November, the third Thursday of November. That's why. And I'm honestly not a huge fan of Beaujolais Nouveau. I've had someone, some that have been okay, but as a category, I'm like, I'd rather drink legit crew Beaujolais. Of course, Beaujolais Nouveau is like nine dollars, ten dollars, whatever. This is, you know, twenty seven, whatever, twenty six. But yeah. It's delicious. Now, as far as Thanksgiving for us at this house, it's just my father, myself, and then family, you know, an aunt coming. So very likely we're not going to crush open these wines or, well, I'm going to be drinking this one, um, like this week, but most likely we're not going to bust these wines out for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, maybe a, after Thanksgiving dinner, we'll come back to the house type of thing. Uh, very likely we'll go out to a restaurant, uh, probably go, I don't know, I haven't decided yet, but I have a feeling we'll probably end over, end up over at Luce. Remember Luce, um, interviewed, uh, Joe, who's the owner and, you know, the owner proprietor of Luce here in San Antonio. And then uh, his buddy, uh, Jeremy, uh, so Joe Bonacontri and then Jeremy Parson, um, try to see Joe a few times a year to, to go hang out with him. He's a little far away from where I live. Um, so it's not as convenient to go out there, but especially special occasions, special like holidays and all that. And Joe always treats us really well. So I want to give him a shout out for sure, because over the years he's treated myself, uh, and my family as family. And it's definitely appreciated, you know, one pies on to the other. So anyway, maybe I think, and you know, we went there last, not last, was it last year? Maybe two years ago, my aunt was in town and we went there and had uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And I mean, Joe just like, just laid it on for us. I mean, it was awesome. So anyway, this is really good wine.
All right, that's going to do it for this uh, special episode for Thanksgiving. Um, there's more Oregon episodes coming up, uh, more interviews. Uh, I do want to make a comment here. I've watched the first four interviews. I mean, I've, of course, I've watched all the video footage. I've watched the first four interviews at this point, and I know I, I know you will have seen the majority of the interviews by now. I think there's only two more interviews that happen after this episode. And I'm just going to say this. I'm the only person doing what I'm doing now with drone footage. I know the drone footage isn't like perfect yet, but you have to realize this is my first time doing the drone footage. Um, but I believe it's a game freaking changer for my, for my show. Um, so if you're not watching those episodes, watch them. It, it's not the whole episode. It's just that having that drone footage for a, basically about two or three minutes of an episode, maybe four minutes of an episode, it just gives you a, the aerial perspective of that person's property. And uh, my father watched, has watched the four episodes right now, four, four of the interviews, and without me prompting him, he just flat out was like, he was amazed and he actually was very surprised. He didn't think it was going to turn out as well as it did. I said it came out exactly the way I thought it would, or not exactly, but I was pretty sure it was going to turn out the way it did. Um, but it's still like a learning process. My very first one, I definitely had some challenges or things I could have done better with the drone footage, but it was really the first time I had done it in that situation. And then at each, each time I went out to the wineries in Oregon, um, I learned something a little bit new, a little bit different than what I had been practicing here in, you know, in San Antonio. Um, but I, I'm not, not to break my arm and pat myself on the back too much, but I'm telling you what I'm doing nobody is doing okay uh and that's what i try to do all the time i try to take my stuff to the next level am i trying to cover up like quality of content with production no i'm just trying to i'm just trying to raise elevate the entire quality level of the show um and i think i'm doing a good job of it uh i still have another what two or three weeks uh, as far as this episode is concerned, when it, when it gets released, to hit 52 solid weeks of content, which I've never done before, and a lot of people don't do in this side of the, of the uh, video wine world, um, especially if you say an official podcast like mine is, um, or even just audio podcasts. Some people just don't put out content every single week. Hey, I, for 10 years, I would take two, three months off at a time. This year, I made a commitment that I was going to put out content every single week, now I'm doing it twice a week. So enough of the, yeah, I know I broke my arm over my back, but I just want to say I'm really proud of what I'm doing. And uh, I, don't, I don't do this very often on camera. Occasionally I do, but um, I'm really happy where things are going. And uh, I have no idea what next year is going to be like, but I'm super excited. All right, so uh, that's going to do it for this episode. You can click the links above. Uh, or I guess they're over here. Uh, click these above to friend me up. Uh, I have links below for all the wines. And um, yeah, and we'll see everyone again next time.